Okay, uh, next up is uh, me. So, I'll be um, talking about the OCT and geography of uh, polypolyploidal vascular disease. So, I think uh, it's very, I just like to say it's great to see so many people here uh, for this course. Uh, I think OCT and geography, it's something that's new and something that we're all very excited about. So, it's something that we can all learn together as, as the technology advances. And I'd just like to uh, thank Dr. Adrian Poole for putting together a wonderful program. And, uh, and all, of course, all the speakers, uh, we've learned a lot from them. So, um, yeah, so this is the workshop. I'd just like to start off with some acknowledgements. Uh, first of all, uh, this work will not be possible without my study team. In particular, I'd like to thank my colleague, Dr. Lewis Lim, who's here with us today. Uh, a lot of the work is actually um, also a significant contribution from him. And uh, Professor Lim Tok Han at the back uh, for, of course, his advice and guidance. Also, uh, I do receive some research grants uh, just to just to complete the financial declarations. So let's start with polyploidal <coughs> vasculopathy or PCV. This is something that's uh, very familiar to many of us here in Asia. We see more of this compared to perhaps in the West. So we know that age-related macular degeneration is the commonest cause of blindness in developed countries. And PCV can be diagnosed in anywhere from 8 to 55 percent of patients with AMD. However, there are important differences from AMD. In particular, it is more common in Asians. And also, the treatment response is different from that of typical AMD. For example, uh, we know that from the Everest study that the use of combination therapy with photodynamic therapy, as well as antivascular and arterial growth factors or anti-VEGFs, has better outcomes. So um, this is quite different from AMD, where we just treat with monotherapy. Now this chart summarizes the prevalence of PCV that has been reported in various studies. We can see that in the West, the prevalence rate ranges from 8 to at most 12 percent, whereas in Asian populations, the rate varies from anywhere from 22 to even 55 percent in the Japanese population. So this is something that's important and common amongst us here in Asia. PCV can present in a variety of ways. They can sometimes occur with what is quite an orange subretinal nodules. They can of course present with sub-RPE and subretinal hemorrhages and exudates. And they can also have pigment epithelial detachments, which are quite obviously seen. In some cases, they may just have serous fluid and initially be mistaken for central serous retinopathy. And in other cases, they can, they can actually have a patient with central serous retinopathy can eventually develop PCV when we do a follow-up angiogram. So the di unifying diagnostic feature of PCV is the presence of a nodular hyperfluorescence on endocyanin green and geography. And we need <coughs> ICG A in order to diagnose PCV. What if we use just fluorescein and geography alone? Well, in this case, you just see some hyperfluorescence, obviously some CNV on the fluorescein angiogram. Would we call this typical AMD? Well, only when we do an ICG angiogram, we see the polyps as well as the branching vascular network. And there are reports of patients who were diagnosed as AMD, who were refractory to anti vegf monotherapy, who were subsequently diagnosed as PCV only when endocyanin green angiography was performed. I think I was uh, sharing with uh, Dr. Starengi over lunch yesterday that uh, in a certain center, which I shall not name for political reasons, not from Singapore, but from overseas, where a patient with, was diagnosed as AMD, treated with anti vegs for 18 months before someone decided, oh, let's do an ICG angiogram, and lo and behold, there were polyps. Right? So this is something, of course, that I think uh, we tend to do more in Asia, ICG angiograms. And it's quite important because we know that the prevalence is higher amongst our populations. Besides the use of ICG and of course color funders photos, I'd also like to highlight it's important to have robust and standardized diagnostic criteria for PCV. Not everything that is white on an ICG angiogram, that's hyperfluorescent, is a polyp. Now in this case, yes, I would agree it is a polyp. And of course we chose this image because it's an obvious one. But not everything that is bright there is a polyp. And therefore, it's important to have proper standardized
test diagnostic criteria in order to make sure that we actually diagnose PCP accurately and not some cases of pseudopolyps which may sometimes require different types of treatment or even no treatment. So the diagnostic criteria that we use in our center is the what has also been used in the Everest studies. This is consists of the early focal subretinal ICG hypofluorescence and at least one of the following six criteria here. Four of them are based on ICG. A nodular hypofluorescence stereoscopically, a hypofluorescent halo around the polyp, the presence of a branching vascular network, or pulsation of the polyp. Or clinically, if there, is, there are either <coughs> orange subretinal nodules which correspond to the hypofluorescence on ICG, or massive submacular hemorrhage, which we define as four disc areas or larger. So, besides the polyps, which are, shown, which are obvious, obvious and some things that really draw our attention, is also important when we look at the PCB to think of the branching vascular network or BVM that supplies it. And it's illustrated quite nicely in the series here, where there's a, a femur vessel that originates here, the flow then radiates peripherally to supply the polyps in the over at the edge of the BVM network. So I mentioned earlier that endocytin green and geography is important to diagnose PCB. However, there are limitations of ICG and geography. For one thing, availability. It's not available in all centers. Some centers choose not to use it. Some others have other constraints. It requires intravenous access as well, so it's invasive. The use of the drug, whilst generally very safe, can sometimes result in allergic reactions, sometimes even an anaphylaxis. There is a cost, it is quite costly, and of course, time is required. The whole sequence of ICG angiogram, from the start to the very late phases, um, can take 20 minutes or more. And I, I, I like to, of course, acknowledge our, some of our photographers from my center. Uh, sorry for all the trouble. I know it takes a long time. So hopefully, with some uh, new technology, we might, I might be able to cut down on that. So, OCT and geography, we've heard a lot about it, and I think some of uh, my fellow speakers have summarized the benefits very succinctly, very nicely, but I'll just quickly recap that it is, of course, it is rapid, it is non-invasive, it does not require intravenous injections of dyes, and also the it allows both qualitative and quantitative assessment of the blood vessels. We can see the details of the microvasculature sometimes more clearly than on angiograms, but of course it does not show leakage, and therefore this is one limitation that we have to overcome. We are used to seeing leakage on fluorescein angiograms, uh, this is something that we don't get on the OCT angiogram. <coughs> it also shows the content and not the wall, and it provides depth resolution, which is something that a fluorescein angiogram does not. So I think this is a technology that we're all exciting, excited about, and this is why we're here. And we want to see how this can be applied to conditions such as PCB. So to date, we know of two publications on the OCT angiogram features of PCB, one from Korea, one from the West. When, I'd like to reiterate again, when we talk about PCB, we are thinking both of the polyps as well as the branching vascular network that supplies it. So it's important to consider both, and we're going to take each of these in turn. With the branching vascular network, in summary, so far, both from the existing literature as well as from our own experience, we found that OCT and geography is at least comparable to, or often better than ICG and geography. I'll give you some figures on this later. We find that the margins are well defined. The intensity of the flow has been seen to be fairly uniform throughout. This may tell us some things more about PCB, but it is very clearly seen. So let's take one example. This is one of our patients. Of course, this is on the left of the ICG angiogram. We can see the polyps here and here, possibly here, as well as the branching cluster network. Now, those of us who are experienced in that note reading ICG angiograms will recognize this as a PCB. We know that this is a BVM, but this is somewhat blurry. Can we see the individual vessels? On the OCT angiogram, we can. We can actually 
see the individual vessels that make up the BVM very nicely. And on the edge here, we can see the polyps. And I'll discuss this again when we come to the polyp structures. Here's another example from one of the publications. Again, the polyps and an outline of the BVN, which is more clear, clearly seen here on the, IC, on the OCT angiogram. So, again, we know that this is abnormal, but and we can, and this is enough for us to treat, we can draw the outline, but we wanted to see the individual vessels, and especially what happens to them after treatment. Obviously, the OCT angiogram seems superior. Yet another example where you can see the polyps, we know that there's some abnormal vessels on the ICGA. We can even see some of the outlines here, but this portion is not very clear. And yet, on the OCT angiogram, we can see very clearly the radiating patterns of the blood vessels, both on the choroid capillaries layer as well as on the deep retinal layers. And, I'll, and, we can, and we've noted that these are the two layers in which we typically visualize the BBN. Here's, here's another example. Again, we can see polyps. A hint of a perhaps hourglass-like shape of the BVM, but a bit fuzzy. And yet, we can see very distinctly two regions of abnormal vessels on the OCT angiogram. This helps us to visualize and identify the margins of the BVM more precisely if we are to plan, for example, for the dynamic therapy. So how about polyps? Let's talk about polyps. After all, this is what we all get excited about on PCV, right? So for polyps, this is a bit of a different picture. Again, to summarize, visualization of polyps can be seen on OCTA. However, it ranges from 42.9% to 77.8% uh, in, in our experience. Uh, I'm not sure whether maybe we were, why we're so high, maybe I was just imagining it or something. But essentially, this is from our series. We, found, we looked at a series of PCV patients. When we identified a polyp on an ICG angiogram, in 78% of eyes, we were able to also see a polyp at the same location on an OCT angiogram. I remind you that this was lower in other studies only about 50% or less. However, on the, when we saw a BVN on the ICG angiogram, we found that 91% of the time, we were also able to see this on the OCT angiogram, showing the difference in terms of the uh, clarity of lesions. Let's take some examples. This is one of our big oh, um, sorry. Before that, uh, we also sort of looked at the structures and we sort of came up with some terms, uh, which of course I welcome your comments and suggestions on. Uh, we found that there are different patterns of the polyp. So there's a uniform filling where it's quite the, the, the intensity is quite uniform throughout. There's some there are some polyps that appear to have an internal architecture where there in, you can see the, the gaps in it where and this reflects the architecture perhaps of the polyp. Yet in others we see a bright ring around the region where the polyp is. And in, unfortunately, in many cases, we see just a hollow area here. Now, of course, the point is if we have an ICG angiogram to see it, we know there's a polyp there. But if not, would we confidently call this a polyp? I think that's the impression. So just a summary of the frequency of the various features of uh, PCV, the various structures seen on both the outer retina and the core capillary stain. Here's a... Here's uh, one of the examples from, uh, uh, one, from one of our patients. On the left, the ICG angiogram. On the right, the four layers of the OCT angiogram. So we see polyps here, here, as well as the BVM. Now, when we look at the superficial layer, we find that it's normal, deep layer normal. I wouldn't be able to tell this from the normal eye. When we get to the outer retina, we see a bit of the outlines of the BVM and perhaps the polyps here. And on the core capillaries, very nicely, the BVM. We've seen this photo before, but also the polyps. And if, if I were to magnify this and highlight the polyps, we can see that this polyps has like a multi-lobulated structure, which is mirrored here in the OCT angiogram very nicely. Here's another patient. Uh, color fungus photo looks perhaps grossly normal. This patient was actually referred uh, for diabetic retinopathy, um, 
So it was almost fortunate that he was referred for that because when he came in, the clinician saw some orange nodules and a bit of edema there and ordered the angiogram which shows the polyps as well as the branching vascular network. Again, to orientate the ICG as well as the four layers, nothing very much on the superficial layers but on the deep, out on the outer retina we already see the outline of the polyp as well as a hint perhaps of the BBN but much more clearly seen on the coronary capillary layer. If I were to magnify this, we can see that this has a bit of, well, I, 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 I always get reminded of a, a leaf, you know, the veins in a, leaf, in a leaf where there's a central vein and it comes out on both sides of the vessel of BVN. And you can see this more clearly here. This is the central vessel here, the straight one, as well as those coming out from the sides. And again, we see the polyp structure, this one with internal architecture, which corresponds to this uh, polyp over here. Here's a third patient. Uh, I'm not sure how, whether it comes out very clearly. There's a hemorrhagic pigment epithelium detachment here, and there's a bit of irregular pigmentation here. ICG angiogram shows polyps as well as the BVN. Again, when we look at the comparison, we can see the BVN very clearly, very nicely on the outer, on the deeper layers, the outer retina as well as the pori capillaries. However, when we try, try to look for the polyps, we don't see it. In this case, we can see a hyperfluorescent nodule here. It is, it is nodular. Um, I'm, quite con and I'm quite convinced it's a polyp. I know, I know it looks a bit small, but trust me, uh, I do see a polyp there. But when we do the steered images, we just see a hollow area. So could we confidently, just with an OCT angiogram, tell that there's a polyp there? I don't think so. Right, so that's a um, current limitation. So here's another example uh, where, again, very nice, big polyps, BBN. And we see some structures here, but hollow areas where the polyps are. And these are very active polyps, obviously. Some examples from other authors, again, polyps seen on the ICG angiogram, a hint of it here, but a lot less convincing. Right? I, I, I wonder whether I would want to constantly, well, perhaps diagnose, maybe, suspect maybe, but would I want to diagnose PCB, and would I want to treat based on this? Quite questionable. Another example, very uh, old clump of polyps, the branching vascular network, and the yellow arrows indicate locations of some of the bigger polyps and we just see a hollow area there. Okay. Here's, here are two examples. Um, the, they did not show the corresponding angiograms, but the arrows point to the locations of the polyps. So we're trying to emphasize, I think, the, uh, the uh, OCT features, the structural OCT features. But again, we don't see a polyp. Right. So if I were trying to plan, say, a PDT based on this, I'm not sure how I would actually uh, plan the treatment zone. Another example from another publication. In this case, yes, we do see the polyps, but um, you know, it tends to be perhaps less distinct than on an ICG angiogram. Another good illustration of a very nice branching vascular network. Polyps here in the periphery, and we see a small one here corresponding to this, but this big polyp here and here are just hollow areas, probably from the pigment epithelium detachment, which overlies it. So these are limitations currently on the, our ability to detect accurately the location and the size of polyps. Let's see another example. Very large polyp here, because smaller ones around it. Hollow on the outer retina. Pora capillaries, yes, we do see something but a lot smaller than on the ICG angiogram. So, which do we treat? Uh, I think this would be a question that is going to be something that we have to ponder over. And yet other examples, again, fairly obvious polyps on the ICG. These are things that we constantly call polyps, but they are hollow PED areas, and only a hint of some, something in there on the OCT angiogram. Also, Although this is not 
based on uh, OCT and geography, uh, it has been shown that on other modalities, including repeat ICG, PCD lesion sometimes may not be detected. And the authors suggested that this could be because of a reduction in flow in the polypoidal lesion. So this is something that is a possible reason. The flow rate has been good. If it's too, too low, it may not be detectable. Also, from the experience of ourselves, as well as from other authors and other reports, the polyps and the BBN may be obscured by the presence of some of these features. Extensive edema, significant excavation, obviously, large areas of hemorrhage, and very large pigment epithelial detachments. In fact, I think many of the hollow areas that we saw corresponded to areas of pigment epithelial detachments. And also, it's important to remember that there's automated segmentation of OCT and geography. This can be fooled by distortion of anatomy. And we know that PCV, the retinal anatomy, can be quite distorted. So just how clear are the polyps? I mentioned earlier that um, the issue, there's an issue of clarity, and we took a look at this in our series. Let's look at the polyps themselves. What we did is we said, well, let's look at the ICG angiogram, look at the OCT angiogram. Which one do we think is clearer, or are they about the same? Either one will do. For polyps, in 87% of the cases, we found that the ICG angiogram showed the polyps more clearly. In contrast, the reverse was true for the BBN. In 65% of cases, OCT angiography showed the branching vascular network more clearly compared to ICG angiogram. And in a further 15%, the clarity was about the same. Only 1% was this, uh, was it uh, better on the ICG angiogram. So far we've been talking about on fast OCTs. Uh, let's talk about cross-sectional OCT angiograms as well. So basically the OCT angiogram also shows structural V scans through flow. So this is something that can be useful. It's been reported that the polyps and BVN are located between the RPE and the Brooks membrane with no extension of the coronal circulation. So this was a segmentation that was used in this paper and they found this to be, to be more helpful in detecting the polyps as well as the BVN. But I think we heard from Dr. Storangi yesterday that it's important to move the layers around because that can show you different things. So in cross-sectional OCT angiograms, we found that the flow signals with, are seen only within focal regions of the polyps. And there are large areas where the polyp lumen is devoid of flow signal. And this is consistent with what we know of the histopathology of PCV, which I'll illustrate in a minute. And it may be relevant in terms of monitoring. So for example, by treating a case, is it going to become less or more, or is it going to stay the same? So this is an example of the histopathology of the polyps. Uh, and I won't pretend to know uh, all of this, but essentially we know that the polyp is not a uniform, hollow structure. They have walls with hyaluronization, macrophages, and so on. So there are, there are structures within the polyp, and this may be the reason why there are also differential flow signals on OCT and geography. It's another example of the anatomy of the polyp. It's not just a simple hollow nodule. Let's look at some examples. This is a very nice illustration. On the left panel are three different patients with the standard OCT and on the right are the corresponding OCT angiograms. So we can see this line, nice round structures, oval in this case, and, and we now know why, um, of the polyps, which are also seen on the OCT angiograms. But the flow signal is only seen where the arrowheads point, only a small portion of the entire region of the polyp. In this case, it is quite similar to that of the OCT. In this case, though, it is quite different. So Two small areas here, there's, there's a lot of hyperreflectivity on the standard OCT. Another example where the flow signal is only in this little area here. And in this standard OCT above, below the OCT angiogram cross section, where they can see very nicely the areas of flow. So, so far we found that um, in PCV, what do we know? We know we can see PCV on OCT and geography, so that's good news. It's useful to this disease. The branching vascular network is seen in the majority of eyes, and the 
clarity is at least as good or superior to step ICG in, a, in many patients. However, polyps can only be seen in 42 to at most 78 percent of cases, and the appearance is variable. Some of them, frankly, not very convincing unless you have an ICG on your to compare against. Now, why is it that we can't visualize the polyps? I think it's something that obviously we don't know the answer to, but it may be related to the polyp structure, as I mentioned, and also possibly to the flow rate. So we know that on OCK and geography, there can be flow, but if it's too slow or indeed too fast, we may not see a signal. And this could be the reason, the reason why only certain regions light up. What are the implications? First, we need to diagnose PCB. When see the problem, can we call this a PCB lesion? So we well, PCB lesions require there to be polyps, right? So if we can't see it, we can't diagnose it. Do we know whether it's active after treatment? Is there a recurrence, for example? Is it just a BVM that is active? Or are there polyps that we can possibly choose to laser or uh, perform photodynamic therapy? So again, for this, we need to see the polyps. And of course, treatment options. Uh, definitely, there are different treatment options available. Photodynamic therapy with anti-VEGF photodynamic therapy alone or anti-VHS and uh, there's still some debate I'm sure each of us perhaps has our own opinions and pra practices so I'm not here to uh, tell everyone how we should treat I think there's still room for discussion on that but if we choose to do photodynamic therapy then we need to plan the treatment zone and in this case we need to cover the polyps in, with the laser spot if we don't see the polyps then we can't, we can't cover it so let's take one example. This is one of my patients. Nice uh, series of polyps at the periphery. Branching vascular network in the center. Um, and uh, you know, this is, I know this is a bit like computer games, right, where I'm planning the various circles. But this are uh, some areas where I think I was aiming to see whether I can perform either more focal therapy to the polyps or half fluence therapy because she's had previous treatment. But in any case, on the OCT angiogram, we see again the very nice chunks of the branching vascular network, perhaps more clearly than on the ICG angiogram. But where there might be polyps like here, it is not well seen. All right. So I would not be able to plan the PDT using this image. Also, this is perhaps a bit unfair in a sense. Uh, we've heard about magnification, so this is probably a more appropriate representation of the area covered. So if I were to use the OCT angiogram as current magnification, um, I would have to do a montage of scans. And of course we know that that's a bit more difficult right now. The new software allows us to uh, overlay, uh, do a montage and all that. Uh, I haven't tried it, so I, I'm, I'm sure it'll be exciting to do. But again, it means repeated scans where we can miss out on certain areas. Um, we can do a wider scan, but the question is, know that the resolution drops with, with that. So, um, I'd just like to summarize briefly some of the pros and cons of OCT and geography. So for speed, we know that image acquisition is faster. Uh, depends on the machine as well, of course, um, but it's still faster than doing a full angiogram. It's not invasive, not contact, it's compared to invasiveness. The field of view, though, is smaller and it's more confined to the your pole. It is cheaper. Leakage. If we want to look for leakage, we need an angiogram. We do not see this on an OCT angiogram. There's better spatial details in the z-axis. That means it's not only the on-fast image, but as well as the, the uh, depth. Fixation. Patients require to fixate because currently the eye tracking um, is still uh, more limited. And of course, the characteristics of the image. If we want to penetrate hemorrhages, exudation, to see the polyps at the BVN, perhaps ICG is still more helpful. However, the correlation between structures on the B scan as well as the on fast image is obviously better using OCT and geography. So, to summarize, for PCV, we, we, can, we know that OCT and geography can be used to identify features. It is especially helpful when, when ICG and geography is either unavailable in that center 
or contraindicate that the same patients are allergic to the dye. However, there are false negatives, especially for the polyps themselves, and it's important because this can potentially influence our treatment decisions. Okay, so having spoken about that, uh, let's just move on to retinal and proliferations proliferations. Uh, a bit slightly different, uh, in the same vein, but obviously quite different behavior from polyps. We know that RAPS uh, variant of excluded AMD has been classified as a type 3 corridomal vascularization. It has been reported to occur in uh, between 10 to 40 percent of patients with newly diagnosed AMD, so it's not in, that insignificant. It has similar presentations, but pigment epithelial detachments, exudates are more common. Some of the papers have shown that it's more common in older people, more commonly white. But some of the features that are characteristic, clinical features, can help us identify focal, intraretinal, or hemorrhage, in, uh, some hemorrhages, the dilated right angle vessels, the thickened vessel that goes in. It often occurs over pigment epithelial detachments and it may have visible anastomosis. We can use standard imaging, and I think I would uh, agree fully with Dr. Storengi that uh, multimodal imaging is important. Uh, I don't think there's only one imaging modality that's going to take over the world, unfortunately. All right? uh, it's, it's good for us, good for our patients, that we have so many choices available, all right? and we need to choose which one to deploy for various cases. So we can, it's been, uh, obviously, fluorescein angiography and color fundus photos have been used in the recent CAT study. They looked at the rat lesions and they had some diagnostic criteria to use, again, consisting of focal intense intraretinal hyperfluorescence. Um, I don't know what I'm not going to recite. It sounds almost like the start of a PCD definition, but it's a bit different and, some of, and at least one of these criteria. ICG also shows some characteristic features such as a half-in loop that can be late phase hotspots on the ICG and the anastomotic uh, vascular communications can also be seen. On a typical OCT, a standard OCT, we can see the sometimes we, on a correct cut we can see the hyperfractive lesions in the areas that can be disruptions of the RPE and often occurs over a pigment epithelial detachment. So there are different uh, stages of RAP. Uh, this is the diagram from uh, the paper by Yanuzi. Stage 1, where it's intraretinal. Stage 2, where it is not subretinal with or without uh, pigment epithelial detachment. And stage 3, where there's some RPE neovascularization. So in some of the earlier papers on RAP, they use um, various other modalities, fluorescein angiograms showing the leakage, a hotspot on the ICG, and even on time domain OCT, they, you can see it's hyperreflectivity. Another example of the hotspot on the ICG, fluorescein angiograms not so convincing, but again on the OCT, pigment epithelial detachments, intraretinal cysts, and a hyperreflectivity. So does OCT and geography help us? Well, the lesions uh, are often characterized by retinal retinal anastomosis. So they arise from the deep capillary plexus and they form a tough shape, high flow network in the outer retina. So there's uh, often this tuft of vessels and if you look carefully, you might be able to identify the feeding vessel. So here's one example of a publication where they Look at the structural features, um, a more magnified view on the ICG angiogram. The, o the OCT shows the intraretinal cyst hyperreflective area, and on the OCT angiogram, the vessel, which is then extends into the deep layers. Another example where there's an intraretinal hemorrhage. The OCT again shows uh, quite characteristic features, but most importantly, over here, in the, even in the, in, the, in the deep plexus, you see the origins, as well as the actual wrap lesion on the, on the, on the, in the deeper layers of the OCT angiogram. 
is one of our patients where we see a nice rap lesion on the OCT, on the ICG angiogram. Superficial layers, the superficial uh, plexus, nothing, deep plexus, we're at the hint over here, then a nice tuft in the outer <laughs> retina, as well as the pore capillaries. So there are limitations, obviously, for this, uh, and these are limitations that apply to all CT angiograms, not only for RAP, but obviously we need patient cooperation, um, and there are, of course, artifacts that are possible, errors in segmentation, whenever there's distortion of the anatomy. So sometimes, of course, the flow velocity is something that we all have to be conscious about, because if not, we may not be able to detect the lesion, even though it's there. So these are things that we will need to think about, uh, that all of us will have to work together to share our experiences, our knowledge, and I'm sure with advances in the technology, we'll be able to pick up even more science and find more applications for OCT and geography in this disease. Thank you very much. question is that if there, um, could it be related to how active a polyp is? Because we know that some polyp may be inactive and some may be active. Could the, you know, low flow, high flow may indicate whether this might be active or not active based on OCTA? Thanks for the question. I think that's a very insightful comment, very good question. Um, so sorry, I don't know the answer to that, but something that I think we should look at. Um, indeed, there's the issue of flow within polyps and as well as the branch vascular network. And we, and we do know that the, some eyes with polyps have a lower flow, whereas others have a higher flow. Is this of uh, prognostic significance? I think that remains to be seen. In terms of the how this this correlates with the OCT angiogram features is also a very is something very is something that we I don't know yet, but it's a very good uh, thought and something we should look at. What I will say is that, that there is a difference because um, in some cases when I see this on the ICG angiogram, they look the same in terms of the, you know, the intensity of the hyperfluorescence, for example. But yet on the OCT angiogram, they look quite different. So that's going to be something that we felt was answered because it's not as if we don't see anything on the polyp, on, on the ICGA, and we only see it on, say, an OCT, a, a P, a P, we actually see it. And so some, sometimes we see, it, we see it on the ICG angiogram, but we don't see it on the OCT angiogram. What does that mean? Does, you know, would it, might it mean perhaps that it's less active, less aggressive? Um, these are questions that we will, I think, need to study in the future. I might be mistaken, but um, sorry, I'm not being mistaken, but I might be mistaken. But when we looked at the pictures just now that you could see the polyps, it appears as if you had to go slightly deeper compared to the BVM. Network. No. Is that right? Or was I mistaken? No, it's, it's, is uh, it, it's the BVM is best seen in the core capillaries, which is the yeah. deepest layer. Yeah. So uh, it's a bit, it's you can see it more superficial on the outer retina. That's right. Yeah. Okay. yeah, that's right. But some of these are also just uh, segmentation artifacts. So right. um, in some cases, I didn't, I didn't want to confuse the issue. I, I actually can show examples where you can see this in the superficial plexus. Right. We know that PCD doesn't, I hope, go there. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. I just wanted to ask whether the OCP angiogram is there any difference between the BVM and the CM and the CM? Is there any structural difference on the co-captures on the OCP angiogram? So, uh, that's a good question. Something, it's not, we haven't looked at that um, right now. Um, what I would say is that somehow the BVM seems more distinct on it. On a typical PCB lesion compared to, uh, say, an AMD. But um, I don't have uh, any like, data or specific figures to back that up. But, um, so if, but the, I think, as you know, sometimes if a patient has been treated already and elsewhere, for example, and he just comes in, we just see a BVM, is that an old PCB with no, no active polyps or is it just CMB? Um, and uh, so that, that's something that's a bit difficult. But 
so far we've been looking only at patients where we know they have PCV, and so we, we've been following them up. And we know that's the rest low PVN from uh, from from you know, from previous uh, prior to treatment. Giovanni, uh, can you go uh, back to the uh, slides where you actually have uh, before the discussion? Because you show you show a very nice image. This one, uh, and actually, if you go to the previous one, where we had, uh, okay. I just want to underline what I said yesterday about uh, the atrophy and visualization of the coronal vasculature. Here is, it's uh, over the arrhythmia pigmentative. So even if the arrhythmia pigmentative is intact, you see the huge coronal new vessel, it looks like a normal coronal. Uh, at least the uh, base of the size, but it's completely white. So, and, and that is actually explaining again the importance of having or not having the abdomen. Then there is another one uh, that I actually try to understand because uh, you show the polyps in the B scan, angio B scan, but it was quite strange that there was no. Uh, uh, projection uh, artifact. And I wonder if uh, related to the locate okay here. You see the white uh, dots uh, indicated by white arrow. You see that there is no effect underneath. And I wonder which kind of material is that because it's not reflecting. Uh, it's a masking, you know, the, the part beneath you know it's, it's kind of uh, interesting Feature. I don't know if it's common in a polypoidal lesion, I've never seen, so I'm just asking you if you've seen many times this very nice round shape, uh, white things without any projection effect. Right, so um, I, I haven't actually looked uh, so closely at this, but uh, I'm going to go back, uh, this is from one of the other papers that we looked up, so I'm going to go back and look at our, our series and I'll, so I'll get back to you on that. Right now, I haven't actually looked at it, uh, but that's a, that's a very good point, and I think it's interesting, uh, like you said, what, what exactly is this? Uh, well, I think it's a strike that is completely wrong shape, mm -hmm. because yes. uh, usually it should be, that means that it's quite flat. Yes. And again, probably it's just part of the polyps where the flow is different. Yeah. yeah, I was about to ask whether it could be just a flow differential. Did you see uh, any differences in the clinical presentation versus OCT angiogram? Like the full clinical presentation that you showed, CSR versus exudation versus hemorrhage. Was there any difference in the OCT angiogram? Could you distinguish? So clinical, so clinical features that might predict the OCT angiogram. Uh, yeah. Not, I don't see any patterns right now. We may not have enough cases, I guess. But uh, right now, I don't see a pattern. Obviously, there's a very significant hemorrhage uh, that we would even look be able to get a good uh, OCT angiogram, but other than that, uh, nothing very specific. Colin, have you had a chance to look at pulsatile polyps from the OCT? Not, I, if I recall, none of these were pulsatile, so that's, that's a... It would be interesting if you, if you have a pulsatile polyp and to look at the flow characteristics of it. And do you know whether the flow is picked up in a linear fashion or it also picks up flow that goes round and round and sort of without any particular direction of flow within a polyp structure? I'm not very sure. Maybe we can ask. Michelle, do you know? Because it seems to pick up very nicely if it's on a plane and it's in a linear fashion, right? moving from point A to B. But then if you've got flow that really doesn't move anywhere, is it less efficient in picking up? And that might account for why even large polyps don't often show show up. I'm not sure it's possible. I'm not sure. It's very difficult. Uh, about the pulsatile, the 
is actually quite strange because uh, even if it's post attack, you, you see the branch uh, feeling, but the bridge is still not visible. Probably, you know, it's uh, again it's a matter of uh, uh, speed and, and it's just uh, at the edge. And, uh, and in fact, if you look at the post attack uh, feeling, you see actually the branch feel, but uh, Say again, it's a type of way, but the uh, bridge takes much, much time. So, probably, I mean, one of the key questions when OCTA first came out was whether or not it would ultimately replace ICGA because of the difficulties with ICGA and the cost. I think the, the current evidence really does not uh, allow us to stay conclusion. If you really wanted to visualize problems, I think it's still the ICG as a case standard. And I want to ask you about your 78%. Did you look at the ICG first and then look at the OCTA or the other way around? Because I normally look at the OCTA first and then look whether or not I was right on the ICG and I'm often wrong. Uh, so my rate is about maybe 30, 40%, nowhere near 50%. Right? Um, so I wanted to ask how, how you uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. I think this is something uh, that uh, Lewis and I and the rest of our team uh, discussed and sort of, uh, debated. The intention of our initial review was to say, I know there's a pilot on the ICGA. What do I see on the OCTA, if anything? So it's a descriptive more than anything else. Um, we haven't, we're going to go on to talk about, now that we know what to expect to find, the range of findings, how frequently can we, if, we, I, if I were just to look at the OCTA, um, you know, uh, what would I, would I be able to predict accurately using the ICGA press or standard? So maybe ne next next year's next course we can talk about that. I, I, we haven't gone into that phase yet. Uh, have you, uh, is it possible to evaluate choroidal ischemia? Um, well, I think the choroidal, first the, the visualization of choroid is not so well seen, I think, but so we haven't really looked uh, looked at it very closely this year. And what can we learn about the branching vascular network that we do not already know on the ICG? Well, I think one comment uh, from one of the papers was that the flow characteristics within the BVN was fairly uniform. Does, does that tell us anything? I mean, might, might we expect perhaps, say, the more peripheral branches to have slower flow or less flow? Um, the, Intensity of the flow seems the same, but obviously I think we will have more metrics to measure. Now, now I think just showing the presence of flow within that vessel. Um, you know, we don't really, we can't really measure velocity just yet. That would be, I think, perhaps interesting. But I think one, one thing that I, I found interesting is that I can see the individual vessels better, and so that may allow us to look at whether the vessels actually change over time in the treatment, for example. Uh, something that may not be so distinct on the ICG. My main caution is that uh, we are looking at flow and not leakage. Yes. All our treatment paradigms are aimed at slowing or stopping leakage. So it does not necessarily translate into more success in your treatment. It doesn't mean that just because you don't see the lesion and that the flow has been reduced by your treatment, it's getting better. Not necessarily. Yeah. Absolutely. So a lot more to learn. I hope all of you will continue to contribute uh, to this growing field. Many of you in this room uh, are actively involved. Tokhan, do you have any uh, final comments about OCTA, where you think it's going? I think the ability to see the branching vascular network without ICG and injection is a big plus. The second point that if we have better way of uh, elucidating this policy of OCTA, maybe the imaging algorithm will kind of tweak it. That is a wonderful tool for follow up after the initial treatment this time. Most of the time you can't do monthly ICGs at this point. And we will come back to this topic a little bit. Barring, you know, just about it, but uh, Giovanni will talk a little bit more about how we can monitor AMD you know, because it is a related condition and, and, and how we can learn lessons from uh, OCT and guide our treatment. Thank you very much, uh, Colin. That was excellent. So we're going to break now for tea. Can we come back uh, by 10?